there is such a sense of urgency that so many activists, advocates feel in this movement. And there, that makes sense. Like there's a reason for this, you know, it is, we have, you know, basically we are awake to the fact that we live in the midst of a global atrocity that the vast majority of the world is in denial about. And, you know, we live in a world that daily offends our deepest sensitivities and is incredibly triggering and traumatizing at that. Like there are high rates of what's called secondary traumatic stress. It's just like we could even just say post-traumatic stress in the, in the movement. It's almost the same thing. Um, and, um, you know, and, and many people in the movement have this, have had these, tra have been traumatized. And I know we'll talk about this a little bit later because it's a big, big issue. Don't realize that they're traumatized. And yet the traumatization that they're experiencing is causing them to engage in these dysfunctional behaviors that are part of the problem of infighting. Welcome to the Animal Rising podcast. We're joined here today by Dr. Melanie Joy. She's a psychologist and an educator, as well as an author of best-selling books, including Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows. Um, she's here today to talk about her latest release, How to End Injustice Everywhere. Her work's been featured in media outlets across the world, and she's been the recipient of loads of awards, including the Ahimsa Award, which was once awarded to Nelson Mandela and Mahatma Gandhi for her work on global nonviolence. Um, so before we get into things, Melanie, would you like to tell us a bit about the book itself and why you wrote it? Oh, sure. Um, so the, my new book is called How to End Injustice Everywhere. And um, I, I wrote the book because when we think about like all of all forms of injustice, right? Like racism, patriarchy, speciesism, carnism, just all forms of animal exploitation, environmental degradation, you know, and, and also more interpersonal injustices like, like domestic abuse, we can see that they all share a common denominator. And this common denominator is relational dysfunction or dysfunctional ways of relating um, to other individuals, between social groups, um, between humans and non-human animals, between humans and the environment. Um, and we're also always relating to ourselves, which we can talk about a little bit later. Um, and what this means is that, you know, given that relational dysfunction is a common denominator among all of these different forms of injustice, building what I call relational literacy, which is the understanding of an ability to practice healthy ways of relating, is a common denominator in ending all of these problems. Um, relational dysfunction, which will, I know we have plenty of time to unpack this concept um, for people, but it's also the main driver of infighting and also of counterproductive advocacy. And both of these are issues that cost all movements, particularly, you know, here we're focused on the vegan, you know, movement, I would say the animal justice movement to be more accurate, um, cost a tremendous, tremendous amount of resources and can lead to a tremendous amount of harm. So, you know, until those of us who are, you know, helping to bring about justice really understand relational dysfunction and know how to change it, which, which we can, um, we really risk recreating injustice even as we might be working to end injustice because this, these relationally dysfunctional behaviors, they result from a, a particular mindset. This mindset is at the foundation of, of all of the most pressing problems in our world and also in our personal lives. And so if we don't recognize this mindset and the behaviors it gives rise to, you know, our movements and our groups are really at risk of cannibalizing themselves. So I really wanted to, um, I wrote the book in part because I wanted to shed light on this common structure of all unjust systems. All of these systems share the same structure, basically, and they all stem from the very same mentality. And so I really wanted to help advocates who are working to end any injustice to understand the interconnectedness of all injustices. Um, and with this understanding of this common denominator, right, advocates for humans, for non-human animals um, or the environment are a lot better able to support, you know, rather than you could say thwart each other's efforts and to unify across causes. This doesn't mean that we all work for all causes, right, because we only have so much time in a day, right? But we can recognize that the ultimate goal of all justice movements, you know, the, we could say the meta mission that we all share 
at the end of the day is to create a more relational world. So, you know, really, if we want to end injustice, we have to change the way we relate. And this requires, you know, largely, but not entirely building relational literacy. I'm not suggesting that building relational literacy is like the only solution to ending injustice, but I would say that it is absolutely foundational to all other solutions. Um, it's, you know, we can think of building relational literacy as sort of like a, a meta intervention. It's like an intervention that we're a tool, right? That it can improve the impact of all of the other activities we engage in, you know, whether we're more, you know, are, we're talking about building, you know, campaigns or building strong, effective teams or creating more strategic plans, you know, our outreach is just more impactful when we're more relationally literate. So I, yeah, I mean, I really wrote this book to, for, for all kinds of advocates and, and, um, you know, a, one key part of it I know we'll be talking about today is helping to understand and, and address infighting in movements. And we'll focus today on, on the vegan movement in particular, because that is a, a huge problem, um, you know, that's really, that's plaguing our movement. Yeah, incredible. I think, yeah, so much of what you've mentioned there and what we'll talk about, it's really, really important to creating this change that ultimately we're all fighting for the same change, whether we go about it in the same way or not, it is that, um, was it meta movement you said? Mm. I love that term, that was brilliant. Um, this idea of the, the relationality between things is um, something that Animal Rising has grappled with since its mm. conception. We've sort of had, for the last six months at least, our top line message has been uh, to fix our broken relationship with animals and the natural world. And you'll probably mm. hear like a variation of that in any interview you watch. Um, which I think maybe where things slightly differ or correct me if I'm wrong, is that we've also tried to bring in um, non-sentient beings into that, this idea of the natural world and how we occupy it. Do you think that's also something where we can find a similar sort of relationship and address that in a similar way? Well, I mean, when we think of ecosystems are made up of living beings, right? So it, of course, it makes sense. You know, we, we ecosystems, you know, because ecosystems are made up of life and, and, you know, billions of living beings, if we're including insects, particularly, right? Um, so absolutely. And when we talk about this later, like we talk about what I, you know, write about in the book, which is at the foundation of, you know, the harms that we cause to the world and to other beings um, is this particular mindset, this particular mentality, I call it the non-relational mentality. When we unpack that and talk about that, I think it'll be clear that this is exactly the same mentality that causes us to relate to the natural, the quote unquote natural world as though it's a resource for us to use for our own means, as opposed to, you know, an ecosystem or set of ecosystems that is home to billions of sentient beings who, um, you know, have, have a right to be able to coexist. Hmm. Do you think it's that that's the same thing that feeds into what you've called carnism in the past? Well, I mean, it's interesting that you say that. So probably a number of people listening are familiar with my earlier work with Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs and Wear Cows, that, that book, which is um, what I wrote about, car uh, which is about carnism. And for people who are not familiar, I'll just give a quick like summary of what carnism is. Um, I, I, when I um, was, uh, let's see, this was back in the when did I write it? I went to school. I did my doctoral studies. I focused my doctoral studies on the psychology of violence and nonviolence. And I, I really, I had become a vegan before that and had sort of like woken up to this atrocity uh, that was happening to, you know, farmed animals in the world. And I was shocked. I was horrified. And I was like, how is it that rational, compassionate people are supporting something that is clearly in opposition to how they want to operate in the world and to the outcomes they ultimately want to create. I mean, these are people who care about other animals. We know that uh, what, and care about the environment, care about their health. And yet they're literally daily, multiple times a day, directly enabling what could only be called a global atrocity. And that led me to do my, my research on the psychology of violence and nonviolence broadly, and then focus it on the psychology of eating animals, which led me to identify what I came to call carnism, the invisible belief system that conditions people to eat certain animals. And uh, interestingly, when I, when I did this work, um, I ended up with, you know, my focus was on really understanding 
the system you know, that I came to call carnism, understanding the system. How is the system structured? How does it keep itself alive? What kind of mentality does it instill in people so that caring people support uncaring practices without realizing what they're doing. So I really deconstructed and looked at the architecture of the system and the very specific psychological defense mechanisms that people have internalized that keep the system alive and the way it's carried out. And by the time I had done my research and written about it, I, I realized that I had ended up with you know, sort of a, a blueprint actually for oppressive or unjust, we could say, systems in general. Um, carnism is actually structured just like all the other problematic isms, um, you know, from racism to classism to speciesism. Carnism is a sub ideology of speciesism. Um, and, you know, and, and really I wanted to Ex expand on this at some point, like along the way. And so how to end injustice everywhere is an expansion on that. It is looking at not just, you know, carnism, but like taking this understanding and explaining the architecture of unjust systems in general. And these unjust systems do not only include the broader sort of social systems that we just talked about, these problematic isms. They can also be smaller systems. A system is simply an entity that's made up of two or more parts. In this case, we're talking about people, right? So the smallest system we t we're talking about would be a relationship between two people. Um, you know, so your relationship is a system. Your friendships are systems. Um, your workplace is a system. Your family is a system. And this mentality, this problematic mentality drives the kind of harmful, unjust behaviors that we all experience in the smaller systems that we're a part of, just like it drives the problematic behaviors in these broader problems. These are like microcosms. These smaller systems are microcosms of the, the broader system. Um, and it also drives the problematic ways that we relate to ourselves. And I said earlier that we're always relating to ourselves. And a lot of people are like, you know, when I say that, they're like, what are you talking about? But our primary relationship is with ourselves. We are always relating to ourselves through, for example, our self-talk, right? You've got a voice in your head that's always talking to you. And by the way, most of us talk to ourselves in a way we would never tolerate coming from other people, you know, and we relate to ourselves through the choices that we make that impact our future selves. And particularly people who are like conscientious, like really concerned about their impact on others and on the world, we can have really harsh inner critics. And I have met many, many people in the vegan movement who are really not relating to their se themselves in a way that is helping them to thrive and in fact are doing the opposite. So everything that I'm going to be talking about here today applies to that relationship with ourselves as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think that feeds nicely into, um, I wanted to talk about some of the problems within the, within the vegan activism movement and um, uh, with Animal Rising sort of sits somewhere within the um, the space between the climate movement and the animal rights movement. And we're trying to bring those two issues together. Similarly, I think because we see they're rooted in exactly the same thing as all these other isms are as well. So we're trying to tackle them together. But because mm -hmm. of that approach, we've often faced um, some difficulties with communicating with other groups and with working with other groups, especially. Um, but I think within the vegan movement and the animal rights movement, especially that comes from a lot of pain or guilt or feelings towards yourself. You know, once I ate an animal, so you still feel guilty about that. And, and that sort of relationship with yourself that I think down the line can really damage how you're acting and what you're putting out there. Um, mm. yeah. What, what is the impact that you think that has had on the vegan movement and how do you see that materialize? You mean, when you say, what is the impact that that has had? Do you mean, is that meaning the way that people are relating to themselves in a way that's not terribly compassionate? Yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's a really good question. I think it's sort of like a feedback loop, right? So there are people who have come into the movement who, you know, kind of start out and they are inspired and they don't necessarily have a problematic relationship with themselves, or maybe it's not that bad, but as a result of, you know, being 
in groups that may have some degree of um, problematic dynamics or of just getting traumatized by having witnessed the suffering of, of, of non-human animals or of just, you know, being impacted by the toxicity of some of the infighting in the movement, people can actually start to develop this problematic mindset. And then the more you have it, like, the more you relate to yourself in a dysfunctional way or a, a non-relational way, the more likely you're going to relate to other people that way. And the more other people relate to you that way, the more likely you'll relate to yourself that way. So it's a feedback loop. And let me explain this a little bit better. Um, and maybe we, we could stop and actually talk about what I'm referring to when I'm saying mm. a relationally dysfunctional way. So people have something to kind of hold on to. Yeah. Um, but these, these are the way that we relate tends to reproduce itself, right? If we relate in a way that we could say is healthy, we increase the chances that whoever we're relating to is going to relate in a way that's healthy. We're watering the seeds of health in them, in their dynamics. When we relate in a way that's not healthy, we're increasing the chances that that other person is going to relate in a way that's not healthy. So our relational behaviors tend to be contagious and reproduce themselves. And this is really important to be aware of because when we're talking about relationally dysfunctional behaviors, People often think of these as toxic behaviors, but they don't have to be that extreme. They can be very subtle. You know, they are contagious. So the more we do it, the more they get replicated. And you can see, and this is one of the reasons that like infighting is contagious. You know, the more there's infighting, the more there's infighting. And it's one of the reasons it's so important for us to really address it. Um, do you want to, do you want to pivot? And I can just sort of define these behaviors that I'm talking about, relational yeah. versus non-relational? That would be great, yeah. Okay. So um, so I had mentioned earlier that building relational literacy, the understanding of an ability to practice healthy ways of relating, is fundamental to social transformation, to, to helping end injustice, and to ending infighting. And it is also fundamental to helping transform our personal experiences and relationships. I, I can actually say personally that for me, building, having learned and built relational literacy is the most important, probably the most important thing I've ever done in my life. Um, and it changes everything. I mean, it's like the difference between being able to read and write literacy and not being able to read and write in some ways. Um, so relational literacy is made up of a, a whole bunch of principles and practices and, and tools. Anybody who wants to build it can can absolutely can learn it. I have a my book, Getting Relationships Right, is like a, a one stop guide to building relational literacy. Oh, you have it. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but all of it, you know all of these principles and tools they're they're based on one core foundation, which is. Um, at the core of all of them is um, what I call the formula for healthy relating. This is a formula for healthy relating. This formula applies to any kind of interaction we have. It applies to any kind of relationship we have. This formula applies to how we communicate. Communication is the primary way we relate, how we relate to other animals, how we relate to other humans, how we relate as social groups, how we relate to ourselves, right? So this, this is a one formula for healthy relating that applies to all of these different things. Um, and the formula is this, in a healthy interaction or, or relationship, we practice integrity and honor dignity. Now, integrity is the integration of our core values of compassion and justice and our behaviors. That's, that's what it is. I'll simplify that even further. When we practice integrity, we treat somebody else or ourselves, if we're relating to ourselves, but we'll focus on others here. We treat someone the way that we would want to be treated if we were in their position. So we treat them with respect. So that's practicing integrity. When we honor someone's dignity, that means we perceive of, we think of them and also treat them both as worthy as having fundamental or inherent worth. That means that they are no less worthy than anyone else on this planet of being treated with respect and of occupying space on the planet. So when we practice integrity and honor dignity, this leads to a sense of connection and security. So if you think about, for people listening, right, if you think about a relationship you have in your life that you consider a really good relationship, just take a moment and pick a person or somebody um, to think about. 
chances are you trust that that person respects you. They treat you with respect. They honor your dignity. They see you as fundamentally worthy being, no less worthy than they are or anybody else of being treated with respect and occupying space on this planet. And chances are you feel secure and connected with them. Now, relationality, or I should say healthy relating, does not, it's not an either or phenomenon like most things in life. It exists in a spectrum. It's not on a spectrum. It's not like, oh, this interaction was healthy or unhealthy. It can be more or less healthy or unhealthy or dysfunctional is just another word for unhealthy. Um, and so on this spectrum, you know, we have on one side what I call relational behaviors. These are behaviors that reflect the formula. On the other side of the spectrum are what I call non-relational behaviors. Non-relational behaviors are the opposite. They are relational behaviors in which we violate and we act them out. We violate our integrity. We act against our integrity and we harm the dignity of another. And this causes a sense of disconnection and insecurity. And if you think about, you know, a relationship in your life, that's not a good relationship. Um, chances are you recognize that that other individual doesn't practice their integrity toward you. They don't treat you with respect. They don't honor your dignity. They look down on you. Probably I don't think you're worthy of being treated with respect and you don't feel connected with them and you don't feel secure in their presence. Right. And so, um, so this is the formula for healthy relating and this formula applies not only to our behaviors and of course attitudes, you know, it's not that a, it's not we're, that we're just talking about a non-relational behavior or a relational behavior, but this formula also applies to the systems that we are a part of. And this is important because non-relational systems are basically oppressive systems when you think about it. So racism is a non-relational system. Classism is a non-relational system. Carnism is a non-relational system. The whole system is structured so that people in the system, in this case, the people with power in the system, violate their integrity. They, they disrespect others they, and they harm the dignity of others. And this creates insecurity and disconnection. And what these systems also do is they create unjust power imbalances right? And these power imbalances grow over time. And so one way to think of these systems is to think of an abusive relationship where you've got a person who's consistently, you know, wielding power over the other and consistently violating the formula and growing this power imbalance between the two people. The thing about the formula is that you can come back to it at any moment in time, like when you're interacting, you know, and you can just pause. If you're having an interaction and something feels like it's gone sideways or it's going sideways, ask yourself, Am I practicing the formula right now? Do I feel like this other person is actually practicing the formula toward me? Am I practicing the formula toward myself? Am I, you know, putting myself down or am I shaming myself? Or am I actually relating to myself the way that I would want somebody else to relate to me? Mm. That's really interesting. As you've been talking, I can kind of picture that from the very personal level with a one-on-one -on -one relationship right up to sort of government level and see like mm. how those systems are replicated. Um, I think to bring it back to the idea of uh, within, within the movement, within the animal rights movement that we're operating in, I think there's another element at play um, that can really have a big impact and that's sort of the pride that people carry and when you are doing so much and giving so much to a cause as we see a lot in this movement that people really give everything they have mm. that in, in a way that can often be, end up being unhealthy, that they're not treating themselves in that way, um, in, in the way we'd, we'd want to treat ourselves. But it can also mean that you then have so much pride wrapped up in the way you're doing things because you've given so much. And I think that's completely understandable. I've definitely, I've been involved in climate and animal rights activism for a couple of years now. And I've, I've done things that are gonna have big impacts on my personal life. And to remain strong in that, you have to believe in that. and. There, mm -hmm. there can be a lot of pride bottled up there. And then it can be hard to separate that from the question of what's right. And it can be easy to get almost angry when people think a different approach might be more effective. Mm. And I think that's something we see a lot between, between different actors within the animal rights movement. Um, yeah, is that something that, that you see? And then 
I think on top of that as well, there's a lot of trauma that gets added to it with people who have been exposed or, or witnessed things that are happening to animals, the way people have been treated by by the police or by other people within who 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 they come into opposition with. How how do you mm. think that affects things on that kind of practical sense within the movement? Yeah, totally. Um, so you bring up some really, really good points. And um, I so one thing I'll say is that relational dysfunction is not the only cause of infighting. It is a leading cause. It might even be the leading cause, but it is not the only cause of infighting, not by any stretch. So, you know, you bring up some some very good points. I mean, we we do there there is such a sense of urgency that so many activists advocates feel in this movement and there if that makes sense like there's a reason for this you know it is we have you know basically we are awake to the fact that we live in the midst of a global atrocity that the vast majority of the world is in denial about and you know we live in a world that daily offends our deepest sensitivities and is incredibly triggering and traumatizing at that like there are high rates of what's called secondary traumatic stress it's just like we could even just say post traumatic stress in the in the movement it's almost the same thing um and um you know and and many people in the movement have this have had these tra have been traumatized and i know we'll talk about this a little bit later because it's a big big issue don't realize that they're traumatized and yet the traumatization that they're experiencing is causing them to engage in these dysfunctional behaviors that are part of the problem of infighting and and the fact that we you know people tend to fight you know infighting is basically just like any form of fighting, you know, what we could call outfighting, for example, you know, it's, it's no different from outfighting, except that it's directed against members of, of one's own group. Um, and I, I will back up and say some of what we call infighting in the movement is actually not, I would call that in bullying, you know, a fight implies that there's two or more people involved. Um, and, you know, some of the infighting we see is one person using their power or their platform mm. to fight against somebody else. Um, but the, the inf people fight in general, whether it's infighting or outfighting, when they have some sort of a difference, a difference of opinion, a difference of want, a difference of need, and they use aggression to try to change the other person, right? They don't, so they don't know how to engage around their differences in a way that helps deepen understanding. And instead they engage with their differences in a way that creates, you know, deeper divisions. So, so when we build relational literacy, we can learn to navigate our differences in a way that strengthens the movement rather than weakens it. Um, but we also need to take on this issue of, of secondary tra traumatic stress, which is just like post-traumatic stress disorder, except that Secondary traumatic stress affects the witnesses to a trauma or to violence rather than the direct victims of violence. Another reason is because um, we're really angry. Um, there's a lot of anger in the movement. And again, our anger makes sense, right? Anger is, um, anger is a legitimate emotional response to witnessing injustice. You know, your anger is a sign that your moral compass is working. And it makes sense that we're angry. The thing is that how we relate to our anger determines whether our anger is helpful in that it helps end the atrocity or harmful in that it like creates toxicity that then drives infighting and reinforces the problem that we're trying to, to resolve. And we can talk a little bit more about anger later if you want to, but this is, it's definitely a key driver of infighting. Um, Another reason that we have so much infighting in the movement is that we are activists and activists take action. You know, by definition, people who are attracted to this movement and in this movement or in any justice movement are people who are people who want to take action when they see something that's wrong. They don't yeah, just sit back. <laughs> right. And then on top of this, um, we, you know, many people have, many of us have inherited this change strategy, like a, a strategy to, which is an approach to getting people to change their behaviors or attitudes, um, which everybody does, right? We have a difference of opinion and then we try to convince somebody else to change in order to, to you know, find mutual or, or reach agreement. Um, this is just the way people are. The problem is that many of us have inherited a change strategy that's actually not only unproductive, but also counterproductive. And yet we keep using it and reproducing it over and over again. We can talk about that a little yeah. bit more what is it later you mean as well. What by that 
that change of strategy, like in, in action, what would that look like? Well, um, so there is a strategy, it was back in the 1950s in the U.S., um, where th this is where the strategy emerged from, where um, there were people who were working to try to navigate, to try to manage addictions, basically. These were not people who were professionals or therapists, they were like just lay people who were creating these peer communities to try to manage their own addictions. They're mostly white men. And... Um, they were trying to determine, like, what strategy, how do you, this was the question, how do you get somebody to stop engaging in a behavior that's causing harm to themselves and the people around them, right? How do you get somebody to change that? Eventually, like, the therapeutic community joined in in the conversation, too, and then this conversation became more mainstream. But anyway, the conclusion that was reached um, among people in these peer communities and professional therapists at the time was that, well... Somebody who suffers from addiction um, has a fundamental flaw in their personality, their character. Something is fundamentally wrong with them. And what's wrong with them is that they are inherently defensive. Mm -hmm. And what this means is that the only way to get through to them and to break through to them is with high volume, aggressive confrontation. You might have heard this expression, break them down to build them up. Mm -hmm. um, right. So break them down to build them up. And so this idea, and this, by the way, Alcoholics Anonymous AA was not part of this. Um, it was other communities. Um, and so this led to this strategy becoming really widely adopted and promoted that caught on by advocates and the mainstream, whereby the assumption was, if you can just make somebody feel bad enough about what they're doing, then they're going to change. And of course, a part of this approach was to shame somebody. Like if you feel shame, ashamed enough of yourself, if you realize how bad what you're doing is, you know, you're going to have no choice but to change. And, um, you know, fortunately in the 1980s, you know, they, people started doing empirical research and, um, you know, the research demonstrated that no, not only is this approach not effective, it's actually counterproductive. So we actually, when we use this aggressive confrontational approach, when we use shame in particular, like even small doses of shame, we end up creating the opposite outcomes of what we want. We end up actually getting people to dig more deeply into their existing beliefs. Um, and, but it, but at that point, you know, the strategy had taken on and you can see that so many people in activist communities, and I can say certainly in the vegan community, Definitely. believe that, you know, hey, we just have to hold a mirror to people who are doing bad things and that'll make them change. And so one of the ways that this, that this um, approach, this aggressive confrontational approach fuels infighting, there are two ways that I have observed that it fuels infighting. One is that um, vegans feel, many vegans feel pressured to adopt the approach. Like if they're not, and I mean, I have heard this about myself a number of times, you know, people who do not engage in shaming behaviors and who are not aggressive in their confrontation are called by other vegans soft and, um, you know, soft and conflict averse and um, sell out. And, you know, I won't even get into the whole sort of gendered problem with this conversation, but um mm -hmm. But, but that puts a lot of pressures on vegan, pressure on, on some vegans to use an approach that doesn't work. But then as well, we use this approach toward each other. Like we've all, like most human beings, at least in, you know, Western society have learned to get other people to change by trying to convince them of how bad they are for doing what they're doing. So, um, so this is this is a really a really serious problem, and I mean the good news is that there's a huge amount of research today on what trade strategies do work and why shaming is so counterproductive. So that it's not really rocket science; it's just a matter of like you know raising awareness so that people recognize what does and doesn't work. Yeah, that's definitely it's an issue that's come up for us in the last year, and quite recently we've had um, some conflict within the vegan movement where. We every year in the UK, there's a National Animal Rights March and um, we were organizing it this year and we decided to change the name and we didn't um, we didn't uh, talk to people about that. And we probably should have and, and we could have gone about it in a better way. But um, we changed it to the March for Animals and Nature. And there was a lot of pushback about mm. with exactly that, with us being soft, with us being we, we were saying we were OK with non-vegans being there. And, and we felt that that was the better way to make change was to invite other people along and to make it a space that people could express their love for animals and express their love for nature and learn about a better way 
But there are other people within the movement who felt that it was a lot more effective to have only vegans there and kind of be what I would see as more aggressive in that approach of sort of shouting to each other kind of about the horrors of animal agriculture. And I, I feel that anger and I do understand that. But I think that was a real clear example of where that conflict can come to. And then mm. in the end, we ended up passing over the organization of that march. And um, yeah, and, and that it definitely could have all been handled in a much better way and to have less conflict and have come to a better conclusion there, I think. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's a good example. Um, and it's like also a good example of what surely are well-intentioned vegans, right? Using an approach that's causing more problems than it's actually resolving. And so, right, you can say, you know, a lot of times the fighting happens because somebody doesn't communicate or make a decision in a way that's perfect. Like, oh yeah, well, it would have been good to open up this conversation and ask people their opinion before we changed their name. Mm -hmm. That was a mistake. But when people make mistakes and particularly, you know, there's, we, we do have this sort of moral perfectionism in the movement. And I think in a lot of movements, actually in a lot of the world today where, you know, kind of one slip up, one selfish decision, one, you know, I don't know, wrong word uttered. And, you know, you can very easily get attacked as like being perceived as the enemy. And I think when we, there's this, this way that, um, you know, when people believe when we'll talk about vegans, right? When vegans believe most vegans engage in infighting or ostensibly, you know, supposedly because they say, Oh, I believe that you're doing something that's harming the movement. And because you're doing something that's harming the movement, basically because you're doing something that's causing harm, I now have license to do something harmful to you. It's not a conscious thought, surely, in most people's, you know, thought processes. And as I said, the vast majority of vegans, I mean, thank God we have people in the world who are doing activism for animals. We desperately need this. And, you know, um, it's so that the intentions are good. Most people who are engaging in infighting are coming from a place with good intentions, but the skills aren't there. The tools aren't mm. there. And there is such like the, the world in general, like the kind of global culture in general, and certainly the culture and the movement is such that like, um, we don't not only um, tolerate, but we celebrate moral outrage. And like, and we have this idea that like, okay, as soon as I'm morally outraged, as soon as you do something that I perceive as unfair, unethical, you know, mm -hmm. harmful to the movement, I go from being annoyed or wishing things could have been different to triggered and outraged. And my moral outrage basically gives me a free pass to communicate with you in the very ways, or rather, I could even say to relate to you in the very style we're trying to change in the world. And, and this is a problem. Um, it, it's a really big problem. And your example is great. So instead, you know, being able to, people need to be able to like, kind of hit the pause button and be like, okay, sure. This organization communicated this message in a way that I think, you know, could have been done differently. Let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. Let's have a conversation about that and kind of like practice goodwill in the, in the process. It's also a little bit harder too, when you're talking about an organization, so many activists, um, just think of organizations like they will post comments and commentary about organizations as though those organizations aren't run by people who care deeply about their impact on animals. And yeah, I can tell you, like I have literally sat across from, from a number of people, some of whom are men, grown men who have like wept openly because of things that have been written about them online, them personally or their organizations. And they've been absolutely crushed. Um, it's just so easy to forget that like, you know, an organization is not some soulless entity. It's an entity that's made up of people who are like you really care about their impact on animals and like you are really doing their best. Yeah, I think especially within the activist movement that it's, it, it is just all ordinary people who are all just trying to make this a more just world to live in for all beings. And I think we're too quick to forget that about each other sometimes. And I think as well that when we're spending so much time and so much energy fighting something as big as like the animal agriculture industry or the climate crisis, something huge like that, it maybe feels easier to fight something within the movement you're part of. And that maybe that's a motivator for people 
bringing up this conflict, whether it's conscious or mm. not, I could see that playing a part in it. Um, you talked earlier about um, nonviolence, nonviolence communication, and the psychology mm. of it. Um, and that is a core principle of animal rising. It's, um, it's something that we, we don't budge on, that um, everybody who takes action with animal rising does a nonviolence training, and we sort of learn the basic understandings of the concept. We go through scenarios like the physical scenarios of nonviolence, so not to punch someone if you're trying to run onto a race course or um, how to behave when you're doing a sit-in in a supermarket uh, dairy aisle or something like that. Um, but yeah, I thought it would be really interesting to touch on that sort of psychology of nonviolence because we, we do focus more on the um, physical mm -hmm. manifestations. Um, yeah, so I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about that and how that applies to what we've been talking about and that communication. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I would say that it's, um, you know, I, I, I talk more in terms of relationality, right? And I think what, you know, you would refer to as nonviolence, I would refer to as relational, and we're basically saying the same thing. Mm. And um, it's when I was talking about the formula earlier, um, you know, practicing the formula is, I would say, that is practicing nonviolence. And I, one of the key things to remember, because we can have a commitment to practicing healthy relationality, and, and I want to make sure that people do not, like, take what I'm saying and, you know, hardworking activists who are already overworked and trying so hard to create a better world in the face of a lot of, you know, resistance to the message have this be one more thing to add to the to-do list and one more thing to feel guilty about like I'm not doing it well enough like this is not about either or good or bad right or wrong being perfectionistic mm -hmm. it is the formula is like a signpost as a guide you know this is the direction hopefully that you'll lean in toward greater relationality um I want to just say that there's you know one of the there are a couple of things to be able to I mean if you, you want to talk about the psychology of nonviolence. um keep in mind that increase the chances that we will be able to practice the formula. Um, and, and one is to really understand the difference between relating to your anger in a way that's healthy and relating to your anger in a way that is um, not healthy. And I started to, I touched upon this earlier and I said, you know, anger is, is, is the emotional, it's, it is an emotion. That's all it is. It's the emotional response to witnessing uh, potential injustice. And I say potential injustice because people can get mad at what they perceive as an injustice that may not really be totally unjust. Like if somebody, you know, expects cl kind of classic example is like uh, an, an ab abusive partner expecting their partner to dress the way that mm. he dictates. And, oh, she's not wearing what I told her to wear. She's not making me dinner every night. I'm pissed off. That's an injustice, right? Mm. You know, so it's perceived injustice is what I'm talking about. But anger is the the response to witnessing what you perceive as an injustice. And clearly, you know, animal exploitation is a major, major injustice. Um when you relate to your anger in a healthy way, you recognize it as that. It's an emotion that says to you, your moral compass is working, and hey, there may be an injustice here. And it's really, really important to be able to feel anger because anger gives us the motivation and the courage to take positive action on our own or other's behalf. When we relate to our anger in a way that's not healthy, we're not recognizing it simply as an emotion. We're actually what blended with it or merged with it, right? So we're not saying, I feel angry, or better yet, a part of me is feeling angry. If you ever want to like distance yourself from your anger, if it's getting to be too much, you can actually use this wording. A part of me is feeling angry. It's never all of you. It's always a part of you, no matter how strong that is. You know, we're blended with it. I am angry. I and the anger are one. And we're looking at the world through the lens of our anger. So when we relate to our anger in an unhealthy way, we're blended with it, number one. And number two, usually it has the charge of contempt. And this is really important to be aware of. This is what gets in the way of a lot of us carrying out our, you know, nonviolent ideals and values. Um, we get hijacked by our emotions. We get hijacked by our anger. And then we act against what we know, you know, better. Um, when uh, contempt is the feeling of um, being superior to others, being morally superior to others, it's basically anger plus judgment together. When we feel contempt, this is a red flag that we've placed ourselves in a position of moral superiority over somebody else. 
And when we feel contempt, we typically are disconnected from our empathy from to, toward whoever it is that we feel contempt towards. And this is dangerous. We're not thinking as rationally and we're much more likely to carry out non-relational behaviors toward them. So when you feel contempt, and by the way, you know, people listening are like, oh my God, I suck. I feel contempt all the time. That makes you normal. Like people feel contempt all the time. It's normal. We have been born into a relationally dysfunctional mess of a world and we've all been conditioned to feel contempt a lot of the time. Contempt, however, is one of the most non-relational emotions we can feel. Studies have shown that it's the emotion most likely to destroy a relationship, damage and destroy relationships. Um, and when you feel contempt for someone else, regardless as to what they have done or what they are doing or how much you disagree with them, your contempt is nothing other than a data point. It's a red flag alerting you to the fact that you have lost connection with your empathy for this other individual because it is impossible to look down on someone when you are looking at the world through their eyes. The flip side of contempt is shame. Contempt is the feeling of being better than or superior to others. Shame is the feeling of being less than and inferior to others. It's actually the, the feeling of being less worthy than others, of being treated with respect. And shame is the... It's a driver, it's a, a leading driver, if not the driver, I don't know, but it is a leading driver of some of the most serious problems, emotional driver of some of the most serious problems in our world, certainly in our movement. Um, the shaming, the, the shaming behaviors that we engage in, a lot of them are really subtle, and yet they're no less powerful than the overt shaming behaviors would be. And when we shame somebody, we are basically communicating to them that they are less worthy than others. They have less, we're, this is harming dignity, right? This is when we don't practice the formula. We're harming dignity. We're shaming somebody. We're, when we shame somebody, whether it's another vegan or a non-vegan trying to get them to change their behaviors, we are communicating to them, number one, that we are not safe people. We are not a safe person for them to be around. Mm. We are not safe for somebody to be vulnerable and open and self-reflective around for sure. And we are increasing the chances that they will shut down to our message and shut down to us because people research has shown that when people feel even the threat of being shamed, they go into fight, flight, or fright, fight, fight, flight, or, uh, oh my God, freeze, fight, flight, or freeze. They go into this state where they're less rational, they're less empathic, and they tend to withdraw or attack in self-defense and they, they tend to shut down to our message. Mm -hmm. So, Shame and contempt are two sides of the non-relational coin, and they are the two big drivers of non-relational behaviors. And they are the two big emotions that are driving infighting and resulting from infighting in our movement. And if we can navigate this, the more every person in this movement can commit to not shaming the healthier and more resilient our movement will become. And the less you do this in your life in general, the healthier and more connected your relationships become, including your relationship with yourself. We, say, we shame ourselves all the time. Mm. It's really interesting. I think a lot of the um, behaviors that you've been mentioning, it seems that, that we exhibit towards other humans that uh, whether we should, that, that we shouldn't exhibit to other humans, but that we do. A lot of that is what, we as within the animal rights movement what we are challenging about people's relationship with non-human animals and it seems like that um empathy is something that we really try and carry for for non-human animals but then perhaps we're shifting that treatment and that view mm. of other beings onto other humans instead of onto the animals that people eat yeah, well, actually, you make a really, really great point, um, and and that's really true. And that, you know, brings me to another point that I, I wanted to mention, which is that shame and contempt they only exist in comparison, right? You can't have one without the other. Like you can't feel less than if there's nobody you're comparing yourself to who's better than, and you can't feel superior if there's nobody you're comparing yourself to who's inferior. So they only exist in comparison and they only exist when we have bought into this belief and this belief in what I call the hierarchy of moral worth. This is a myth, 
but we've all bought into it. Everybody, I mean, probably in the whole world. I mean, I don't like to make over generalizations, but it's quite likely. Um, this myth, this belief in a hierarchy of moral worth, which is that some individuals or groups are more worthy of being treated with respect of, you know, the moral consideration of their interests than others. This belief lies at the core of all forms of injustice, all unjust systems, and all non-relational behaviors. We, you know, you just, it's, 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 we often look at who is oppressing or abusing whom, but more important to look at, in my opinion, is how and why we oppress and abuse in the first place. You know, we just keep swapping, we, you know, we can just swap out one group and add in another, you know, the group du jour who's being oppressed. And, um, it, and we will see that this myth, you know, this hierarchy of moral worth, some individuals are more worthy of being treated with respect than others. It's at the foundation of all, all of these unjust systems. And whenever we're engaging in a behavior that's causing harm to someone else, human or non-human, you know, as you pointed out, right, we are disconnecting from our empathy and we are perceiving them as less worthy of being treated with respect, of having their interests honored than we are or than, you know, others are. And so, and we do this whenever we treat an individual non-relational with non-relationally, even if it's just a, another vegan who we're shaming, we're buying into the hierarchy of moral worth. And we we're so conditioned to believe in a hierarchy of moral worth. It's really hard to break out of it. People will be like, well, but, but you're an animal abuser, so you deserve to be abused or, but you know, you're using this terrible outreach method and you're a sellout that's harming the movement. So you deserve to be abused. But what we don't realize is that this is just, we're reproducing the same attitude that we're trying to end in the world. And, you know, this mentality, this is contagious. There has been a lot of research on what's called toxic behaviors, which by definition, they are non-relational behaviors. They reproduce themselves. When we treat somebody with, in a way that's non-relational, studies have shown that that person is more likely to respond to us non-relationally and to treat other people they encounter later in the day non-relationally. Um, some researchers said that like these behaviors spread like the common cold. So, um, yeah, so you're, you're absolutely right. And it's really, really important for us to, to recognize these commonalities. Mm, yeah, definitely. I think wherever possible, we should be challenging that, that idea um, that we need to fight in that way. We have uh, in Animal Rising, one of the projects that we do is uh, the Farmer Dialogue Project, where we have people going and actively engaging with farmers and people in farming communities that we would typically um, be seen to be in conflict with or, or to butt heads with, but we don't want to do that. We want to mm -hmm. engage with them on that relational level. I think a lot of what we've talked about is going to really inform how we go about that and I think that's absolutely brilliant, but it is key that challenging these, well, as, as we've said on the, all the interviews, challenging that broken relationship, not just with animals in the natural world, but with each other and with, within everything, I think particularly in light of the climate crisis, we won't be able to sort of escape this mess unless we do mm. that. We won't be able to build a better, a better world. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's very, very well put. And, and, and it makes so much sense. And a lot of what we're talking about is obviously easier said than done. Um, and you know, this is building relational literacy and, you know, building these skills that we're talking about in general, it, it takes practice, you know, and, and, and awareness. Um, and one thing that can be really helpful, increasing the chances that people will practice the formula or be able to practice the formula. Cause a lot of people think like, well, how can I possibly feel compassion for somebody who's like doing bad things. Um, and one thing that can be helpful is just recognizing that, you know, the, this belief in a hierarchy of moral worth, uh, reflects a profound misunderstanding of human psychology and behavior. Um, each and every one of us is nothing more nor less than the hardwiring and biology that we have been born with. And every single experience that we have ever had throughout our lives, our second to second experiences. I mean, how could we be any different from 
who and how we are. So expecting somebody to be different from who and how they are, it's like expecting a tree that's been rained on not to be wet. You know, very often people will say like, oh, well, if I were him, I wouldn't have done that. Well, well, yes, you would, because he did. Like, if you were him, you would have done that. Um, you know, because so, so it's, it's really important to appreciate this. And this does not mean that we don't hold other people accountable for problematic behaviors. Obviously we need to do that, but holding people accountable and doing it in a way that's effective requires honoring their dignity in the process. It requires having a conversation with somebody and saying, listen, these things are causing harm. These things that you have done have caused harm. And here is why, but not communicating with them from a place of contempt, thinking they're less than thinking you're better than they are thinking if you were them, you would not have done that because you, you would have, if you had their, your, their upbringing and their experiences and their brain and their biology, you absolutely would have done that too. So the more people feel like their dignity is being honored when they're being communicated with, and you know, you're trying to raise awareness about a problematic behavior, the more likely they are to be receptive to the message. Um, I mean, this is the other wonderful thing about practicing the formula. It, it significantly increases the chances that our message will be heard the way that we intend it to be. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. If, if I think about my own journey with veganism, I, I didn't become vegan because of seeing any kind of horrible footage or because of that feeling that I was doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I was already vegan that I was really even able to engage with that side and that reality of everything. And, and, and I think that there's a lot of people as well who have that same progression. I know for some people it does work to see something and then to, to, to feel that guilt and for that to motivate you, but it's not always a productive factor and it's not always effective at all. Um, yeah. And mm. you said something important. I mean, you said to feel that guilt and there's a difference between shame and guilt. Mm. Guilt is the feeling we have about a behavior. We feel guilty when we think I did something wrong. Shame is the feeling we have about ourselves. You know, we feel guilty when we think I did something bad. We feel shame. When we feel like I am bad. And so guilt is an important pro-social emotion that, that motivates people to course correct. Shame is a very demotivating emotion for most people, and it motivates people to self, go into self-protection mode. Now, because we live in such a screwed up world, <laughs> like most people, if as soon as they feel guilt, it flips into shame. So we really have to be careful about guilting people even. Um, and, you know, I, I always caution against guilting people. We don't have to do that because the facts speak for themselves. I mean, the good and the bad news is that when we're advocating, when we're talking about, you know, advocating to non-vegans, I mean, we don't have to hype anything up. We don't have to like water the seeds of guilt in people. It's already there. We just have to create an environment where they become receptive to the message we want to share. And, and that's all we can do really. Um, and I like this Buddhist uh, expression that says, this Buddhist phrase that says, we all have within us the seeds of greed, hatred, and desire. And we also have within us the seeds of love, compassion, and empathy. And our job is just to water the right seeds. So, you know, when we're, what, what you focus on grows, right? So when you're communicating with somebody, whether they're vegan or non-vegan, you know, what do you want to grow in them? Do you want to grow their sense of shame? Do you want to grow their belief that they're a bad person who abuses animals? You know, do you want to grow their feeling that they're like an unproductive vegan? Or do you want to like water the seeds of like, you know, inspiration and motivation and caring within them? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that idea of watering the guilt and everything can really feed into the, the trauma that we were talking about earlier and mm -hmm. that exposure to these horrendous things that, that, that you witness when you engage with this, mm. with, with veganism, with animal rights or with the climate crisis or whatever the injustice may be. Um, yeah, and we wanted to circle back and talk a bit more about that. Yeah, ab absolutely. So, you know, there it is, it's very difficult to not become traumatized to some degree when, you know, you're awake to this global atrocity, which is a global atrocity. It's a mass traumatic event. And um, the problem is that when we become traumatized, right, when we don't know how to prevent the sort of normal reaction of feeling like sad and shocked and, you know, all of the other things that come up when we witness these horrific things happening in the world, or even just become aware of these horrific things happening in the world. If we don't know how to prevent that from turning into like 
you know, real traumatization and heal ourselves from traumatization, mm. we can end up feeding the trauma within us and growing the trauma within us. And that causes a lot of problems because when we become traumatized, um, we develop a whole host of problems, right? And we can start to become really misanthropic, meaning like starting to really hate humanity. Mm. This is understandable when we know what's going on, right? And it gets in the way. When we become misanthropic, it makes it really hard for us to have fulfilling, connected relationships with other humans. And research has shown that fulfilling, connected relationships are really essential for fulfilling, connected lives and, you know, resilient lives. It, it can, you know, we can end up becoming you know, feeling guilty for feeling good and prevent ourselves from ever feeling good. As soon as like we're starting to relax or starting to feel happy, we can start thinking like, oh, well, I don't deserve to feel good because the animals are suffering and dying. Um, you know, we could start to develop all sorts of other problems. And and one problem that, that we can very easily develop is this traumatic mindset. Um, and, you know, we can start to see the world as one giant traumatic event with only three roles to be played. Somebody's either a victim, a perpetrator, or a hero. And then we start to put everyone, including ourselves, into one of these categories and we lose nuance. They become, they become really rigid. And this thinking is like, if you're not with us, you're against us. If you're not one of the good guys, you're one of the bad guys. If you're not a hero, which means you have to be perfect, all good, all the time, one slip up, one sip of non-vegan wine that your grandmother offered you when you were visiting her, you're not a hero and you're not a victim hanging in a slaughterhouse and you must be a perpetrator, you know? And this is one of the reasons we create vegan heroes and then knock them right off the pedestal and call them, you know, and, and villainize them. And we start holding everyone, including ourselves, to these impossible standards. And this is one of the causes of this, this traumatic thinking is one of the causes of infighting in our movement. And you can see this, like vegans getting triggered and reactive and treating other, perceiving and treating other vegans as though they're perpetrators. Like, you know, viciously going after other vegans, <laughs> you know, rather than the real problem, um, you know, which is the animal exploitation industry. And so um, it's really, really important for people to get informed about secondary traumatic stress and the ways to manage and heal from it. And we have a lot of information on this at, at um, uh, veganadvocacy.org, and you can link to this in, in the show notes. One thing I would say that um, is really important for anybody who wants to start to take care of themselves in this way to do is to reduce your exposure to graphic graphic imagery. Like give yourself permission not to take that in. And I've talked to so many thousands of vegans who say to me like, but I feel guilty not watching this because when I think about what the animals are going through, I think what's two minutes, you know, the least I can do is watch it. And it's like, I'm like, what are you doing? You are not helping those animals by watching it. What you're doing is you're feeding your trauma and you're increasing the chances that you are not going to be an effective ambassador for those animals and you're increasing the chances that you're going to burn out and maybe even take on others take others down with you so give yourself permission not to witness you know and and just and and if somebody starts to make you an unintentional witness say to them i'm really sorry like i can't take this in it's not good for me and have healthy boundaries like really good boundaries around this and this will go a really long way for you don't make others unintentional witnesses either. You know, be really, really careful about what kind of imagery you share with people. We need to wake people up to the atrocity. There's no question about it. But the way that we do that matters. And if we are not doing it in a way that's sensitive, that where people give us consent, in this case, I'm talking about non-vegans, you know, then we are, you know, quite likely potentially going to create counterproductive, you know, do something that's counterproductive. So give yourself permission not to witness and Give yourself permission to take care of your needs. And you mentioned earlier that, you know, a lot of vegans become very, um, you could, we could say self-neglecting even, you know, because, and this is a normal reaction when we care so much. We care so much and we're constantly thinking about what can I do to like just help end the suffering, help reduce the suffering. The problem is that we taking care of your needs and particularly your need to feel regulated. And I'll talk about what this means in a second is essential for you to be an effective activist and voice for the animals. And so, I mean, the good news is that taking care of yourself <clears throat> is the best thing that you can do to be an effective animal activist. Um, and the reason I say this, or, or let me back up, um, 
when you don't take care of your needs, you're much more likely to burn out. You're much more likely to um, develop increasing trauma, and you're much more likely to contribute to the infighting in the movement. And you're much more likely to be ineffective in your advocacy. So we all need to be what's called emotionally regulated. Okay. Emotionally reg when we're emotionally regulated, this means that our nervous system is in balance. Everybody knows what it feels like to be regulated. You know, when you're in your happy place, I don't know what it is. You're watching Netflix or something at the end of the day and everything just kind of goes away. Maybe you're regulated. You know, we all know what it feels like to be dysregulated. When you're dysregulated, that means your nervous system is out of balance. Maybe you're overstimulated because you haven't had enough breaks between work or you've got too much pressure on you. Maybe you're exhausted because you haven't slept enough. Maybe you're triggered about something. Maybe you're sad about something. Maybe you had an argument with your partner. Maybe you just had an image pop into your mind of something that distressed you and you got dysregulated. So we have very high rates of dysregulation in our movement. And the problem is that dysregulated people dysregulate people. When you're dysregulated, you cause other people to be dysregulated too. Emotions are contagious. And the behaviors that, you know, when we're dysregulated, we're much more likely to do things that are non-relational, you know? And so um, when you can, and in my, um, we're, we're starting a new project called the End Infighting Project. And um, one of the main components of this is a website, infighting.org infighting.org. We're going to have a lot of information about self-regulation and everything else we've talked about today and a lot more for anybody who wants to become informed about infighting, what its causes are, and how you can become immediately proactive in ending it and taking care of yourself as an activist so you can be in the movement for the long haul. So if you give yourself permission to prioritize your regulation, you will create a happier healthier, more sustainable you, who is a much more effective advocate for the cause and who stays in this movement for the long term. Every day, pause and ask yourself, does my nervous system feel in balance? Do I feel regulated? And then ask yourself, what do I need in order to feel regulated? And then give yourself permission to do that. And the more you can tune in with yourself and know whether you're regulated or dysregulated and learn the tools to self-regulate, we're going to have them up on the website um, as well, learn the tools to self-regulate, um, the better you will be able to practice the formula, the better you will be able to have a fulfilling, happy-ish, you know, as happy as we can be, knowing what we know, an effective life as an activist. So, you know, the good news is that it's like the answer to the key to everything is like win-win. What's good for the movement is good for us. And I should just explain, I've said a few times the animal um, justice movement, I think I've said, and I haven't qualified that. I have been wanting to, and I have written about this, um, you know, it, and I'm curious to hear other, other, other vegans' opinions about this, but um, you know, writing this book on injustice and like really looking at how the vegan movement, the animal rights movement fits in with these other justice movements and, you know, belongs on the map of these other justice movements. I have realized um, that we might be better. Um, it, it, it might be, and I think it is more accurate to think of the vegan movement and the animal rights movement and maybe the animal liberation movement and the animal protection movement, you know, as sub movements of a broader movement that I would call the animal justice movement. And it is a movement truly that is about justice for animals. Um, and that does belong on the map of justice movements right up there alongside of the movements for the environment and for social justice. Mm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think within that, they're, they're alongside each other. But like you've said throughout this podcast, that they're also deeply rooted together in those same mm -hmm. same issues that that we can fight them all by by getting better at certain things. A lot of what you were saying at the end there really came as sort of a breath of fresh air and was almost hard to hear because mm. I think so many people within the animal justice movement, hopefully a lot of people who are going to listen to this podcast really need to hear that and really need to hear that it's okay to give yourself the permission to not look at that footage or to look after yourself and to do what you need to do to be in this for the long run and to be able to stay here mm -hmm. and to be able to give what you can give and to have a good relationship with yourself and with the work through that. I think that's incredibly important mm -hmm. and a lovely message to sort of close on. Mm -hmm. um, if you have any final comments that you want to elaborate on that with. 
Yeah, I would add one point to that, which is to really give yourself permission not to always be the advocate. And that is a big part of why people start to burn out and get so frustrated. We feel like, you know, every opportunity we have to be saving lives. And the problem is that sometimes, you know, you actually really need to just be able to have go to that party and just be you and not be the representative for an entire justice movement, right? You need to just be you and, and don't feel responsible for turning everyone around you vegan. And I know that, you know, it, it might sound counterintuitive because a lot of people are thinking like, oh my God, but you know, we the animals need all the help they can get. And I, I would say that the, the most effective thing you can do is you just pay attention to yourself. Does this feel self dysregulating? Like, do I need a break? Um, you know, do I need a break now? Give yourself a chance, to, the opportunity, the, the permission to take that break and not feel like you have to turn everyone around you vegan and you'll probably end up creating more vegans in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, before we close, I'd just say again that um, Melanie's got a new book coming out that you'll be able to uh, pre-order on Amazon or maybe some other platforms. <laughs> um, it's yeah, we have a, our, they can come to our website. We have, um, what is it? Is it, is it end injustice everywhere.org? Mm -hmm. How to end injustice. Yeah. It's end injustice everywhere.org. They can come to just infighting.org. The book is on that website too. So the book is out in the U S it's just not out yet in the UK, but probably by the time this comes out, it will be out in the UK. Yeah. Amazing. So yeah, I think we've covered so many interesting topics mm -hmm. and there's a lot more to dive into and I'll definitely be getting the book when it comes out and mm -hmm. I hope many more of the listeners will as well. And thank you so much for Great. coming on. I think this has been a really informative and really important conversation to bring into this space. Yeah, thank you. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Animal Rising podcast. You can find out more about Melanie Joy through her website. All the links that have been mentioned will be in the description below wherever you're listening to this. Um, if you'd like to hear more conversations like this in the future, do subscribe to the podcast because we've got a lot more good things to come. Mm -hmm.